I forgot just how good this was. This is wonderful. This movie is a delight. It really is. There's a reason that Quentin Tarantino puts this in his top ten movies all time. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny because it's it's always out on, like right below the surface mm-hmm. of every like best movie discussion. Yep. But nobody ever brings it up because I think people forget about it. Right. But then somebody will say, because inevitably somebody goes, dazed and confused. Right. And then everybody goes, yeah, man. Yeah. I love that movie. <laughs> it was such a delight. It was such a delight. <laughs> so welcome into That Movie Show. Mike Went, Liam Stryker, Bill Neville. We are covering Dazed and Confused. And to pull back the curtain, fourth wall exposure here, yeah. we are actually recording it on the 25th anniversary of its release. That is that is also delightful. That was a fun little uh, tidbit that I realized this morning when I woke up. It was, it, was uh-huh. kind of, it was kind of fortuitous. It was. It, it, you see, it all plays out for a reason. We right. couldn't do it last week because of one thing led to another, led to another, which led us to here on the right. 25th anniversary of Dazed and Confused, which was released on September 24th, 1993. Wow. Uh, budget of $6.9 million. Took home a box office return of eight million dollars. Uh, home video return came in around thirty million, so it did, okay. it did make its money back in home video. Yeah, um, it feels like that's the type of movie this would be. Well, it was. So what we'll get into a little bit uh, is Richard Linkletter, who was the director, the writer. He created this movie. Right. Um, had such a hard time dealing with the studio. Yeah. Uh, it was his first studio movie. He was coming off huge. Uh, huge festival acclaim for his 1990 independent film Slacker, which okay. is basically like Slacker is, for lack of a better term, it's the original 90s independent film. Yeah, uh, it was the you know it's the one that everybody like Kevin Smith pointed to, you know Quentin yeah. Tarantino pointed to. It's right. like we want to be like Slacker. So Richard Linkletter and Slacker kind of started that whole Miramax boom, basically. What became Miramax and all their independent films was championed by that. Uh, But this was his first studio film. Uh, Three years after Slacker, he uh, signed up for Dazed and Confused. He wrote it. He directed it. And uh, basically, I got the the one I watched. I have the Criterion Collection Blu-ray of Dazed and Confused, which has an hour-long documentary. Criterion is great. They do such a fantastic job. Uh, he has a very in-depth, very honest commentary track. Um, the documentary was great. A lot of behind-the-scenes stuff, a lot of deleted scenes, a lot of outtakes, all that fun it's stuff. It's like 25 minutes of deleted scenes. Everyone's right? audition tape. Oh, that's which cool. Which was awesome. Like McConaughey's audition tape, Ben Affleck's audition tape. You know, you're seeing cool. all of these things. So it was really, really, really cool. And it's a great addition. But it also, because it was done through Criterion and not released through Universal, they're, they get those honest moments, like the whole fights between him and the studio. I just don't see them because they're not painted in a great light. No. Uh, but you get the honesty. Um, like basically, so uh, one, I, I think it's one sixth of the budget. Okay. For one sixth of that $6.9 million went to securing the licensing rights to the music. Yeah, okay. That, that checks out. Uh, for example, and as he's opening up the DVD commentary track, Right off the bat, he goes, okay, well, this song costs us $100,000. Yeah. Aerosmith's Sweet Emotions cost them $100,000. Uh, Bob Dylan's Hurricane, $80,000. Just to ballpark what kind of money they were spending. And there was a point in production where the studio was like, enough. We, we can't, because he had picked all the songs they wanted to use. Right. Um, right off the bat, Zeppelin wouldn't allow them to use their well, songs. Well, Zeppelin doesn't let people i mean it was it's very difficult mostly because plant and page don't get along right exactly so it's almost like a spite thing it is and um jimmy jimmy page agreed to let him use because he wanted rock and roll as the closing credit song right and jimmy jimmy page agreed and then robert plant came back with a fuck you yeah of course and he's like man and he like he wrote them letters he sent them tapes he's like look here's how i would use it i you know it's the movie's called dazed and confused i mean it's named after one of your fucking songs yeah right you know uh Uh, it's also funny because they jack black did a very similar thing for school of rock mm -hmm. uh which was also richard linkletter right written and directed um but yeah and it was so difficult and to the point that the studio was telling him you know you're gonna have to start cutting songs we can't, you know, we're spe- <laughs> yeah. we're spending too much money. So what he ended up doing, in order to get the songs he wanted, because these ones were available, they could afford them. Right. He um he took he basically foregoed any residuals off the soundtrack. Okay. And if you all remember, 
Dazed and Confused was released in a double CD soundtrack. Both versions of it went gold. Yeah. So they sold a couple million copies. Yeah. yeah. And he got zero. Yeah. And he talks quite a bit about it in the in the commentary and in the, in the documentary how he basically said, "I don't give a shit. You can rob me. You can take every dime out of my paycheck. Just don't fuck with my film." Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Which you right. really got to respect someone like that. Right. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, and and I talk about this to a lot of people. It's it is an art form, right? right? People people kind of forego that and don't realize, you know, that it is. Yeah, but people take that for granted. People take movies for granted and don't realize that it is an art form, and and the director is creating a vision and is painting a masterpiece. And you see it all the time where movies get chopped to pieces. Mm -hmm. You know, very look at look at the DC films, yeah. right? Those aren't the movies, the right. DC cinematic universe films. Those aren't the movies that um, what's his name wanted to make. Well, Zack Snyder is famous for always having the Zack Snyder cut come out right. on Blu-ray. At the very least, we get that. Right. And Zack Snyder, you know, famously was saying that those weren't the movies that he wanted to right. make. Like, right. the Dark Knight, uh, Batman vs. Superman was not the movie he wanted to make. Right. And you see that with other films, right? And I, I do respect a director that says, this is my vision, this is my movie, right. trust me. Right. And ultimately, those are the movies that we remember. Especially someone, and it's one thing for, like, a Tarantino now, right. a Scorsese now, but this is his first studio film, and he's going toe to toe with them right. every turn. Like, like I said, because that that hour long documentary, which I really, really advise people to check out uh, on the Criterion Blu Ray, uh, but I'm sure if you look through the internet, you'll find it. Um, the produced his producer was talking to him about literally having daily fights with him every time they <laughs> yeah. bro every time they broke for lunch the producer would go up to him and go okay here's what we can't shoot the rest of the day and then they would get into fights over well we know we need that part uh one of the famous ones that everybody seems to talk about because i think because it really resonated with especially people that played little league right is the the good games hand slapping so okay. at, at the end of the Little League game, the kids are all crossing past both yeah. teams. A good game, good game, good game. It's just a little thing that everybody who has ever played a, a Little League sport right. did. Right. They were going to scrap it for time. And basically, he was he was playing a game. So Linkletters uh, was playing a game where if he had something and the producer was coming to him saying, we can't film this, he would then have the script supervisor go to bat for him and be like, well, we have to film it because otherwise we can't cut together this next scene. Right. That's how they... So he was picking his battles. Oh, yeah. But in certain scenes, you had to pick those battles. And again, it's one of those That's things... A, see, the, the flip side from producing stuff right. that that is, you know i also understand where this producer's coming sure from. and but the fact is he they did come in under budget yeah of course and ultimately that's how you stay that's right. how that's how you keep making movies and eventually get to have the the coveted final cut right because hey man look here's the deal i made the movie i wanted to make we came in under budget yeah and Everybody loves it. Yeah. So let me have the money. Listen to me and let me do what I right. want to do because I've proven that I can. And he's and he's done it as, as a director. He's done it time and time again. It's weird yeah. looking because right before I came over here, I was watching. Uh, it's on uh, what the hell? It's on the Roku channel actually. Okay. Uh, so so I, I have a Roku, and on that channel they show TV shows and movies and stuff like that. And there's a documentary called Twenty One Years with Richard Linkletter. And it's all it's basically all the people from his movies talking about him over time. I think it was made like two years okay. ago. And one of the one of the cool things about it is I didn't realize how diverse his filmography really is. You know, from Slacker to Dazed and Confused, before the whole before sunrise, the the, the, the trilogy, right? Yeah, the before trilogy. Yeah. So he did before sunrise, before sunset came later, and then what was the third before midnight. Before midnight, correct. Uh, Suburbia, The Newton Boys, I completely forgot yeah. was his movie. Uh, School of Rock, you mentioned. Bad News Bears. He also did Fast Food Nation. Fast Food Nation. Uh, Bernie with Jack Black, which is one of the few. It's weird because I've said many times I don't like Jack Black as a leading actor. Yeah. I like him as a supporting actor. Right. But he works in these movies. Right. He does. He works. And, and I, I, it has to be who's ever giving him the words to say. Right, you know who the well, writer, the director, all that. Well, stuff because very, I love School of Rock, mm -hmm. and I would agree. I would agree that I'm like I don't like Jack Black as a leading actor, but right. then I'm like, no. But this is a good movie. This is a good movie. It's, it's it's not a rule. It's just like generalization, right? You know what I mean? Uh, he did Spy Kids too. He he didn't direct that. Rodriguez did that one. Yeah, he was. Um, he did. Was he on it? 
He was an actor in it, actually. Oh, okay. That makes a little bit more sense. He was an actor in it. Uh, but he, again, much like Robert Rodriguez, uh, you know, a Texas guy. Right. They're, they're, they're both from that, that Texas area, uh, which is wh- what Days to Confuse was based around. Right. It was a high school, last in day Texas. of high school in Texas. But watching it again, and especially looking back on it now with my adult eyes. Right. It's probably one of the most honest depictions of yes. how high school life really is. Right. Like last week we talked about Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Right. While it's a fun movie, Fast Times is a classic, no question about it. Well, right. It's a very inaccurate description well, of what high school life well, is Well, it's like. funny because I talked about it. I talked about it when we talked when we did the movie last mm-hmm. week, right? I saw Fast Times at Ridgemont High in high school. Right. I didn't relate to it and I didn't like it. It was a lot of fucking for high school. Right. <laughs> right. And I and I you know, now that I I watched Dazed and Confused again right. and you say that, that's exactly what it is. Right. High I, school life wasn't I didn't relate to Fast Times at Richmond High right. because that wasn't my high school experience. I don't think it was many people. I don't to think be it was honest. I, I also assume that my high school experience is the average high school experience. Right. And which looks very much like Days, days Confused. Confused. It doesn't matter what, because this took place in seventy six in Texas, right. but it could be really anywhere. Any time before well, cell phones. I'm hanging <laughs> out I'm hanging out with my friends and really all we're doing is driving from place to place getting kicked out by the right. cops. Driving around looking for a place to drink. Right. Plain that's, and simple. That's it. We're going from the 7 Eleven parking lot to the McDonald's that's open late. Hoping to maybe make out with the pretty girl. Right. You know, maybe we'll see where the girls are and we'll go right. over to that house. You oh, know? The, oh, the parents got home. Party oh, was got, broken up. We got to leave. Let's drive down. Let's go find a place in the woods to drink. How many? Right. I mean, come on. Right. You How know? many high school kids found a place in the woods to drink? Right. I think all of them. All of, all of us. You know what I mean? You know, so yeah, this feels. We all found our own fiesta at the Moon Tower, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> God, that tickles me every time. It's, you know, him saying fiesta just fucking he, tickles me. Uh, him in this movie just tickles me. So, okay, so and McConaughey's something I really want to get into. Um, of course. So this, so it's so amazing to to listen to how he not only got it, how he got the role. Okay, so let's start there. So uh, Don Phillips, who we talked about last week, yep. is the casting director of Fast Times at Richmond High. Now he's casting Dazed and Confused. Uh, they're posted up in Texas. They're doing. They're starting the filming. They're doing the casting. All this stuff. And McConaughey has a friend who's bartending at the Hyatt in Austin. Okay. Calls him. Says the dude that's producing the movie is down here. You should come down. He was in film school at the time. Okay. Yeah. Goes down. Posts up at the bar right next to him and just bullshits with him all night. They don't talk movies. They don't yeah. talk about film school. They talk about football. They yeah, talk about booze. Else. They just everything he relates else. to him as a guy. And finally, at the end of the night. They're they're getting kicked out of the bar. Right. Bar's closing down. He's like, "Oh, come back to my let's go back to my hotel room." And they go back. They grab a bottle. They go back and they keep talking, keep talking, keep hanging out. The next day, he's like, "All right, come on in, come yeah. on in and audition for it." This was Matthew McConaughey's first movie ever, yes. uh, and it's also become his most iconic. I dare I say. Well, this like we've talked about it with Denzel Washington and Al Pacino. Yep. This sets the tone for McConaughey. This is what we pay McConaughey to do. And the amazing thing is, his first line of dialogue in this movie is the all right, all right, all right. All right, right. A, it was improvised by McConaughey. Yeah. B, it's literally become his catchphrase. It is. His first ever line of professional acting dialogue has followed him. He said it in his fucking Oscar speech. He did. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, So... So, okay, my McConaughey story. I teased it last week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, and it involves the all right, all right, all right line. So, uh, I'm, I'm working on Ghost of Girlfriend's Past. Yes. Terrible movie. I don't recommend it. Um, I know another actor that was in Ghost of Girlfriend's Past, and we should do that and have him on the show. Well, we could do that. Uh, it is, as far as all the extra work I've done in movies, it is my most prominent. I was actually a featured extra. Fair enough. Got direction from the director, not just from some fucking PA <laughs> some or AD. AD yeah. No, no, no. Actual director came over, gave me direction. I was in the 80s singles club, singles bar scene. Okay. I was posted up. Michael Douglas has this whole big, long, mo- mo- like two-minute monologue. Right. Well, over his left shoulder, I'm making out with a chick on the couch. Okay. For the whole fucking scene. Okay. It was a wonderful three days of work. Yeah. Anyway, last day of shooting is McConaughey's day. So the first, the first day and a half was Michael Douglas. Yes. And then we did the reverse, and it was Emma Stone and Matthew McConaughey. Emma Stone at the time... 
I only knew from her two episodes on Lucky Louie. Okay, yeah. L- uh, Louis C.K.'s HBO show that lasted one season. And it had just aired, her, her episode had just aired like two weeks beforehand. Yeah. But she looks nothing like Emma Stone in the movie. No. Uh, so I'm sitting there, and we're doing doing the scene, and blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, they call cut, and everybody's back around the monitors just watching. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, and I'm standing next to this girl. And I'm like, oh, I'm fucking looking at her. Like, I know her from somewhere. I know her from somewhere. And f- so, okay, during the lunch break, I go and grab my cell phone, and I start fucking trying to Google who the hell she is. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay, Lucky Louie. Okay, so go back, working, working, you know, boom, playback, and I just go... Just kind of do the, by the way, loved your episode on Lucky Louie. Oh, thank you. Mind, mind you, she, this turned out to be Emma fucking Stone. Yeah, right. Yeah, At yeah, the yeah. time, it was nothing. It was that and Superbad. Right. And so I'm like, I, I, I don't think I had even seen Superbad at the time. Right. So that was my Emma Stone thing, but then McConaughey's Day. Yeah. And it was like, you knew it was because you get we got down to the set it was being held in um it was the club that was called Saint and then it turned into Storyville okay, and, it, yeah. and it, it might be something else now Storyville's the dumbest name for a bar I don't know ever. If, if, if it's still Storyville or not yeah. anyway they, they basically their downstairs bar area had basically like crushed red velvet walls yes. it looked so 80s swingers club yes so it worked and we go downstairs to this to the downstairs bar and I'm just like I'm just smelling weed. Yeah. And then behind this, all the lights are set up in the back of the bar. And out of this plume of smoke, almost like a fucking angel walking through is Matthew McConaughey. I'm like, oh, it's a McConaughey day. All right. All right. So all we, right. All right. So we go through the day. Okay. So fast forward 12 hours and we're wrapped. And it's my last day. And I'm walking down the street. I was going towards Boylston to catch the train. Yeah. And the line of, uh, of trailers is all lined up heading towards Boylston Street. And I'm just walking by, minding my own business, texting my cousin, who's a huge McConaughey fan, and door swings open, and he steps out and starts keeping pace with me. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm like well, I'm done. I don't fuck it. I'm, yeah, I'm, right. I'm breaking that rule where you don't yeah. talk to actors. Well, because, yeah, that's the thing. If you're an extra in a movie, do not, do not, do Especially not. Especially fanboy. Yes. Like, I felt okay because I didn't even know Emma Stone was Emma Stone. Right. I, I just thought she was well, a, a lucky chick who caught a breakup from Lucky Louie. Right. Well, the other thing, too, is is that that level's fine. Right. Like, I hung- like I wasn't going to go up to say shit to Michael Douglas. Right. And he didn't look like he wanted anybody to say shit to him. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? Like, you don't, don't go up and talk to the right. stars of the movie. It's just an unwritten it's rule. It's an unwritten rule. Because they're working, you're working. Be a professional. Be a professional. Right? Yeah. So that's, that's the, what the unwritten rule he's talking but about. But at this point, I'm like, and, and I wasn't going to fanboy out. So I kind of did a casual, yeah. you know. It sounds douchey now, but I turn to him as he's keeping pace with me because we. I took a couple steps. I didn't know if he was just going to veer off or something. Yeah, right. So after a few steps, I turn to him. I go, "Hey, man, good working with you today." Because all right, man. And he and he kind of looks me up and down. And I, at the time, I was into cowboy boots. I wore a yeah. lot of cowboy boots. And he looks down at me and he goes, "Those boots, man. They wardrobes." I go, "No, they're mine." He goes, "All right, man." And that was our interaction because at that moment, all the female extras spotted him and just mobbed the <laughs> shit out of him. And I, and I just, because you heard the scream. Right. Oh, my God. And I just turn and I go, good luck. <laughs> See you later, man. And I'm like, and I, I, I just keep my, keep my cool, keep my cool. I get around the corner on the balls. I'm like, that was the fucking coolest thing ever. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> like, that was my McConaughey moment. That's pretty cool. Um, but he is that guy. Right. Like, he is Wooderson. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is he based the character on his older brother. Yeah, I've he, heard um, that. Rooster McConaughey. Yeah. Swear to God. That's his <laughs> fucking name. So basic. He might have the coolest family alive. Yeah. He's um, a pretty cool guy. He really is. And 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 listening to him break down the character, how he came up with that all right, all right, all right line. Yeah. Is interesting. Do you know it? I, I remember hearing it, but I don't remember. Go ahead. So he's he's breaking down the character because he wasn't supposed to have a big role. Right. Wooderson was a very tertiary character yeah. until McConaughey showed up on set. Yeah. And then it was like Linklater was like, all right, we there was two things that caused him to have a bigger role. One was he's just McConaughey. It's yeah. oh, he showed up on set looking the way he did, being as cool as fucking shit. And Linklater was like, all right, we got to give this guy some lines. Because he really didn't have any lines. Right. He had a couple here and there at the Aporium, but it was like, let's just get, let's get him in there. Yeah. Keep him going. The second thing that happened was um, Sean Andrews, who played Pickford. Okay. And Jason London, who was Randall Pink Floyd. Hated each other. Oh, despite playing best friends, hated each other. Linklater had to break them up. They were fist fighting. Okay. So if you watch it back, knowing that knowledge, 
while they're playing best friends, they almost have no actual interaction with each other. Yeah. And a lot of um, Sean Andrews scenes were cut and replaced with Matthew McConaughey because of that. Right. Because he couldn't work with Jason London, so they brought in McConaughey and just put him in there. So if you always notice, Pickford's always kind of driving off. Yeah. And leaving them to kind of hang out and have the meat of the scene. Right. Um, so he's t- he's breaking down the character, and he's like, all right, well, this guy's into what? what What's he into? He's, he's into uh, smoking weed, rock and roll, pussy, and his car. Yeah. Well, three out of four ain't bad. I'm going to go get the fourth one. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> And as he's pulling up to the redhead in the car at the at the top notch yeah. burger, and I'm like, that is the most scientific breakdown of the dumbest fucking line ever. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Wade, rock and roll, my car and pussy, man. I'm going to get number four. <laughs> yeah, like this guy is wonderful. Yeah, uh, it's just it it just shows you just how cool somebody can be in yeah, a room. Exactly. And yeah, he crushes it. And it is those little things. It is. And and you could tell, I mean, watching this movie back, you could tell everybody, I mean, besides obviously, you know, Pickford and Pink, a lot of the people yeah. really enjoyed each other. But much also like high school, there was a lot of cliques forming because basically you had LA and New York actors occupying a hotel in Austin, Texas yeah, East for Coast, about a month. East Coast, West Coast. And it was like, what do you do? I mean, yeah. McConaughey well, would take them on daily floats down the river. Yeah. Like every one of them in the documentary is like, yeah, that time McConaughey took me down the river was fucking weird. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, and it's I, like, I'm from New York City, man. I don't get that. Yeah. And so I, um, I have had the fortunate opportunity of being on TV shows mm-hmm. and movies as a, uh, as an actor. Yeah. Right. And so I've been a part of something, stuff like this. Obviously, sure. nothing as successful as this. Right. But because you're sitting here with me. Because I'm sitting here doing that movie show with you. Right. <laughs> but, uh, I've been in these type of situations, and it's like summer camp, man. It really is. And that's the best way to describe it, because you're all in this enclosed environment, you can't go anywhere, and you're just with the same people for hours on end, yep. and relationships start forming, and clicks start forming uh, with people, and you know, it's like, yeah, you're going to start dating this girl because you're literally the only two here. Literally, Sean Andrews and uh, what was her name? Mila Jovovich right. got married. They ran off and eloped to Vegas in the middle of filming. Right. I mean, granted, she was 16. Her parents annulled it. But <laughs> but that that's, happened. That's the thing. It's like, this is never going to work outside of right. this. But we're going to think it does. We, we think it does because it's a magical time. We're all in our 20s. Yeah, you know, it's like, look at how you many know? people. And it happens all the time. Because if you think I'm lying, look at how many times... Two actors start playing romantic love interests yep. in a movie, mm-hmm. and then you find out by the end of it they're dating. And then go watch the movie True Romance. Right, they're, that's some of the most real on-screen fucking I've seen in a while. <laughs> yeah, and then you look at it and it's like, oh, these two people broke up after three months of this right. movie. Exactly. And it's like, oh, because as in, when you're in the real world, this doesn't work. Right. That's why. That's why. That's it's why. fun while we realize, oh, we just get a month yeah. of each other. Right. Uh, not the rest of our fucking lives. Yeah, right. And so. Um, but uh, yeah, it was even to the point that um, like Joey Lauren Adams and Parker Posey became like instant best friends. Yeah. And there, there came a point where they realized we don't have any actual scenes together. Like we're in scenes, just not together. Like we're not talking. <laughs> right. Linklater let them write a fucking scene. Came back from lunch and again having a fight with the producers. He's like, "No, no, no, we need this for this, this, this." It it was a fucking throwaway scene of the yeah. two of them drunkenly talking about uh, Joey Lauren Adams' mom roller skating or going to a singles roller skating okay, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually in the deleted scenes. All the outtakes okay. and, and the scene itself are there. And and he talks about it. he's like he's like yeah I let them write their scene and they were great in it and it's like it actually made a few test screening cuts that's fine and then it was like man eh, the movie's a little too long yeah we got to get rid of it the pacing yeah, yeah. makes sense uh, but a lot of that um, a fun fun thing about it is uh, Renee Zellweger okay was up for for uh, one of the roles one of the girls roles and she was going through a lot of the rounds of auditions to the but I know oh she was up for uh, Parker Posey's role. Okay, and then Parker Posey came in and just blew everybody away. Yeah, with with her, you know, interpretation of Darla. But they loved Renee Zellweger so much that she's almost like uh, there's a famous story from The Godfather. Okay, uh, Joe Spinell, who did the fantastic, fantastic cult horror, horror movie called Maniac. Okay, but Joe Spinell uh, was basically the highest paid actor on The Godfather, with the exception of Marlon Brando. 
because he kept showing up and putting in time slips for extra work. So he was literally on set every day That's getting so paid. That was Renee Zellweger for this. They just liked her so much, they kept her around. The only time you can actually see her on camera is when it's um, it's uh, it's Pink, it's Wooderson, it's uh, Mitch and uh, Don. So they're all standing outside the Emporium. It's the, the high school girl line that McConaughey does. <laughs> yeah, She's the blonde that walks past him. Okay. And that's where he gets the, I get older, they stay the same <laughs> age. Yes, they do. <laughs> yeah. And that was her. That's the only time she was on set, like throughout the whole thing, staying with them in the hotel. She's in some of the documentary, just okay. in the background, just kind of hanging out. Um, another another famous name that a lot of people auditioned for this. Uh, yeah. Ashley Judd was, uh, again, high in the running. Okay. Um, Vince Vaughn was auditioning for what ended up being Cole Haas's role. Okay. The reason he didn't get it, he actually, uh, Linklater said he did better in the audition than Cole, but um, he looked too much like Ben Affleck. Yeah. And they had already committed Ben Affleck to O'Banion. Like, okay. he, he's our O'Banion. We can't have the, yeah. these guys just look like brothers. Yeah. Which, funnily enough, the combination of Ben Affleck and Cole Hauser led to Goodwill Hunting, School right. Ties. Go listen to our Goodwill Hunting episode because his his character, is, Cole Hauser's character, is my favorite thing ever. <laughs> yeah. It's in the archives on newagentsize.com. But should we get into the movie? Uh, yeah. We've been talking about the production because I found it so fascinating. Well, I digging mean, into this. Th this is the best part, is you know, especially because like you know, if you want to actually see the breakdown of the movie, mm. go watch the movie. Exactly. Right? right. So it's very simple. It's very simple. We start out literally last period, right. last day of school, May twenty eighth, nineteen seventy six. I believe it, yep. what it was one fifty six p.m. Yeah. He even put the time. He yeah. Said, which he uh, he said was an homage to Hitchcock. Hitchcock always put the time and day on there for yes. some reason. Um, so it, it was the specificity, the the de the devils exactly. in the details. <laughs> there it is, the devils in the details. Um, yeah. So the first thing is, is we find the letter, right? The promise letter of that's the, the MacGuffin. Speaking of Hitchcock, yes, right, and that kind of sets up what this the thesis of the movie, right? Which is, who are you going to be, right? Right, that's basically the thesis of this movie because we find out we find out later in the movie when we actually meet like Mitch is like the freshman and, mm -hmm. and stuff of like who are you gonna be? Right. What are you? What are you gonna do? Who are you gonna be? And so, uh, Randall Pink Floyd, which tickled me Look, a lot as, more. As this. someone that did twelve years as a classic rock DJ, bet your ass every time I had a back sell a Pink Floyd song, it was Randall Pink Floyd. <laughs> yeah. Every fucking time. Yeah. I didn't care if people got the reference. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's great. And so he's on the football team, and the coach is passing out these letters yep. for people to not do drugs and drink. Yep. Um as to like not screw up the the potential championship. It was basically season. a moral morality clause. It was a morality clause. For high school football, which yeah. if you know anything about Texas, is a pretty big deal. Is a pretty big deal. And so I, again, this is probably the first part of this that feels real, yep. right? Because um, I remember playing football, uh, and our coach basically didn't have a sign a letter like this, mm -hmm. but we, in our spring meeting, because we would have our spring meeting for everybody that was on the team, right. you'd come in, you'd meet with the coaches, and then you would actually get your equipment. Mm -hmm. Because if we wanted to hold captain's practices or those if, lovely double sessions in August, right? Well, it would, but it was even <laughs> before you that. You puke. If you wanted to go to a football camp, mm -hmm. right? Because like a lot of the football camps, you have to bring your own shoulder pads and helmets. Right, so they right. would give us our shoulder pads and helmets prior to uh, the end of the the spring. Sure. So we'd have them for the fall, sure. right? Uh, then and so it felt like a lot like that. The coach was kind of a hard ass. Mm -hmm. There was the there was the like assistant coach, the likable assistant coach that was like buddy buddy with everybody, yeah. and so it was like, yeah, man, yeah, I I know you relate completely. Yeah, again, you didn't have to go to school in Texas in the seventies no. to get this movie. No, and it was just like, oh man, I remember, I remember having these things. Like uh, the big thing with my football coach in high school was he gave us his phone number. Okay, right, and so his whole thing was. If you're ever in trouble, call us. And, sure. and like that was that whole thing. So it wasn't quite the same, like, do this and be a good person. But it was like that that hard ass moral figure that's right. like, I'm going to begrudgingly be there for you. Try not to embarrass the school or me. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. And so, yeah, it was super, it was super relatable, right. at least in that end. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing is, is who does Pink think? 
Who does he want to be? Right. Because he doesn't know if he wants to follow this morality clause and play football or live his life the way he wants to live. As he's talking with Don, as they're walking through a school, he's like, we could get as much pussy in the, if we were in a band as we could for football, you know, and stuff like right. that. He also, I mean, Pink is one of those, those the through line characters because he has his, his jock friends. Right. He also has his intellectual friends. Right. Which we find uh, Tony, Mike, and Cynthia. Yes. Uh, who is played by uh, Anthony Rapp. Uh, Cynth uh, Cynthia was Giovanni Ribisi's twin sister, uh, Marissa Ribisi, and Mike was Adam Goldberg. Which, huh. By the way, uh, fun fact, a nice recommendation here, Hebrew Hammer. Go check it out. Hebrew Hammer. The Hebrew I Hammer. I haven't heard that in forever. I fucking love that movie. Oh, can we get a crossover with the Hebrew Hammer and Black Dynamite? I think we should. I think we absolutely should, and we could probably get Adam Goldberg on the show if it takes you know fifteen rounds of calls, but we can do it. <laughs> yeah, we can definitely. Do it. I believe in us. I believe in us. Uh, so let's we, write the movie too. <laughs> it's exactly. We run into them, and everybody's just got. It's the last day of school. Yeah. There's no real assignments. There's no class. No. Everybody's just putting in token appearances here and there. <laughs> yeah. Right. We see Benny in Woodshop making his paddle. You yeah. know, oh, that's Slater's right. Slater's making a bong in Woodshop. Yeah, that's so funny. He's like, "You're not getting a good draw, man. You got to like." There's air the, getting in there, man. You got to put like gum or something. It's like, oh my god! Wonderful. You're putting far too much thought into this. Wonderful. Uh, so yeah, we're just—it's kind of like just meeting all the characters because it is a giant ensemble cast. Yeah. So they got to kind of introduce everybody's roles pretty quick. It's like, okay, right. here's the intellectuals, here's the stoners, here's the jocks. Yeah. You know, and and then set up what they're gonna do. Right. You know, which is uh, paddle freshman. Yeah. Right. Which that also I think has set the tone for Americana freshman. Right. So, like it set the tone because it did. I remember this being a thing, and it was never a thing. Well, you say that. Oh well, kind of. You say that because I was a freshman in high school in 1994. Yeah, a year after this. Okay, movie. that's very different. I literally got punched in the back of the head from a senior that got jumped out of the back of a pickup truck, much like the fucking Jim Dandy scene. Yeah. Okay. And it's just, but again, why this movie is so relatable. That same fucking senior that punched me in the back of the head and did the whole blah, 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 yeah, blah, right. high school motherfucker, all that stuff, was the kid who picked me up for the first party, brought me, got me shit faced. Right. Like, he was literally my Randall Pink Floyd. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? He was the guy who drove me to the party, drove me home at two o'clock in the morning, yep. poured me into my mother's fucking couch. <laughs> yeah, you right. You know? So it's extremely relatable. Right. And it's also. It was described uh, very coolly in the commentary as they're not doing this to pick on the kids. No. This is very much the initiation for what's going to be the next generation of quote unquote cool kids. Yeah, right. They're picking out these kids. Yeah, these are specifically. Yeah, right. Because that's that you ultimately. You your stripes at the lunch right, table. Right. That ultimately ended up happening. Right. Where it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget when me and my buddies were walking down and a couple of the captains of the football team pulled over in their yep. car and were like, get in yep you know what i mean exactly it's, and it's like i have no idea what's about to happen I don't know where we're gonna go i don't know but you <laughs> we gotta get in but the you car. get in the car we gotta get in the car you do not even question that shit you know and so yeah it it's very very relatable oh, absolutely um but, but the paddling thing is the funniest and uh so, so we're also introduced to is it jody is, is that is that uh who's mitch's sister I believe Jody. I believe so. I believe Jody is Mitch's sister. So her and the girls are all in the bathroom. Yeah. Talking Gilligan's Island and and yeah. the, the sexual implications of that, I guess. Uh, but she also runs out and tells uh, Benny and Don and Pink to take it easy on her brother Mitch. Yes. Mitch Kramer. Yeah. It's because he's a little he's a little guy and no. Yeah, no. he's a little guy. So they're like, all right, we'll be fine with him. And immediately he becomes target number one. Right. Of we course. are fucking his world <laughs> up. Yeah. Right. Uh, so they take off. Uh, they head to the junior high. They just right. skipping class. Doesn't again, last day of school. Yeah. This is you know, shit like this just yeah, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Ben Affleck finding the two freshmen, like Mitch's friends. Oh my god. Ben, ben Affleck was wonderful in this. Ben Affleck is wonderful, and I didn't realize it was Ben Affleck watching it the first time. That's too funny. And now watching it again, I'm like, holy shit, that's Ben Affleck. Yeah. I didn't even realize that he was in this movie. Before you got his teeth fixed. Yeah, he was all jacked up. <laughs> but it was really funny because he grabs the two freshmen who's uh Mitch's friends. And he's about to, he's just like, both grab a pole. And then the, one of their moms just shows up with a yep. shotgun. Yep. Oh, God, that was so Very funny. Very Texas. So <laughs> Texas. So goddamn Texas. It's just, yeah, and w again, watching it, it's very much, because it is a day in the life. 
yeah. but, it, but it's a very believable day in the life of right. these students. And uh, it's just, they're going through, and oh, yeah, I got to head home and change and stuff like that. Yeah. Luckily, those were the lucky actors. Yeah. The ones that got to change, so they get a new wardrobe. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. You get the poor bastards that have to kind of sit in their same wardrobe for 36 days. Yeah, right. Uh, God, you know, they, they kind of wash it, I guess. Kind of. It depends on how dirty it has to be. Yeah, right. Um, uh, so, yeah, so the guy, the the male students from junior high heading right. in to become freshmen right. are basically being chased around and tormented by these seniors left, yeah. right, and center. They're, they're being run down in the streets. Yep. The girls are all just kind of huddled up yeah. into, into the backs of pickup trucks, brought to a school parking lot. Yeah. And, and then, humiliated yeah, they're for just, an afternoon. Yeah, they're just like uh, just weird food being thrown on them. Oh, yeah. Just nonsense. E- every Everything, eggs and flour and, and all kinds of weird yeah. grains and stuff were just kind of being poured yeah. on them and yeah. mixed into them. And then they were put on leashes and, and baby pacifiers and forced to propose to seniors' males yeah. who, yeah. of course... If you're gonna be a, you know play, right. playing a 17 year old, you're gonna do blowjob humor. Yeah, right. And, and that's what we get. <laughs> clearly, clearly, that's what we get. Um, the big, the big part of the night is that there's gonna be a keg party at a house at Pickford's at Pickford's house where his parents are leaving. They're going away. Yeah. And in the most unfortunate of circumstances, yeah. The and also rookie move. Yep. Uh, the keg guy shows up at the house while the parents are still there. Yeah, he completely. Fucking botches that whole thing. Yeah, he botched the so whole I got, thing. I got a little bit of action happening. I got to get to. So he was an hour early. Yeah. So it wasn't on Pickford. Right. This was the the fucking beer guy showing up an hour early. Yeah. Right. Um. But it also causes the parent to obviously see through what the hell's going on. Yeah. Cancel their trip, which I don't. I don't know about that one. That yeah. might be the only unbelievable part of this whole movie. Right. Is that they're like, yeah, we're canceling our fucking trip. Yeah. See, the thing is, is where that, were you going? It was so unimportant. Yeah, I do know that there are there were enough dad hard asses. Yeah. That I knew in high school w- that would that would have done that. See, I think what would have happened, at least to, on my my mother's standpoint, she would have had my aunt. Come, Come stay over. at the house. Yeah. 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 Basically babysit the house. Yeah. So right. it doesn't burn down. But Pickford's gets canceled and uh they gotta find a new place to, to, to drink. Do, to drink the kegs. They gotta, gotta find a new place to drink. Um so we also get a we, uh, a fun little side story when they get to the Emporium and they find out that um Mila Jovovich has now painted two statues to look like Kiss. Yeah. Uh there's a, another deleted scene uh where they actually are stealing the statues from in front of a bank. Okay. And, and their bicentennial goes through a lot of this. Yeah. So they were they were kind of like a George Washington and the troops type of drummer yeah, boy okay. statues. The original thing this is uh, this is uh, according to Richard Linklater probably the most autobiographical of all those movies. Okay. Uh, where yeah. it's the most like all these things come from real things. So in his school they stole a McDonald's statue. Okay. McDonald's wouldn't allow the film to use. Yeah. Them. Um, in in their real life it was a Sonic. Sonic yeah, wouldn't let right. it, so they turned Top Notch, which was a local Austin, Texas and, burger and, joint. And what I found recently when I was doing research for this is that that's a real place. It is. And it, you can go there. It's a it's a real place in Austin, Texas. And, Had I um, known that when I went to Austin, Texas, I would have went. You got to Google these things. I do. I do. Um, he, was, he was really adamant about wanting them to drink Schlitz. Okay, and and it's funny how he describes it because every you know when he was a kid, everybody was drinking Schlitz at yeah. the time. It was the number one beer. Believe that or not. And and Schlitz wouldn't allow it because because of the underage implications. Un, well, yeah, they're underage. They're drinking and driving. There's a lot of that yeah. in the movie. Um, so Schlitz wouldn't allow it. And he basically said, "He's like, I wrote them a letter, being very honest. It's like, look, you used to be the number one beer. You're now number sixteen. Yeah, right. Why aren't you going to allow this movie to put you up back on the map? Yeah, right. And do it. So they got just generic labels. Most of the beer, however, except for the underage kids, was real." Okay. So they were actually drinking. I mean, you know, as you do. Yeah, as you That's do. one of the things I always wonder, especially in movies like this where there's excessive amounts of drinking. It's like, how much near beer were you really drinking? Oh, yeah. And they weren't, most of them. Yeah. Most of them were just slugging back real beer. Um, yeah, get those extras hammered. Yeah, exactly. It's a little easier to work that way. So, are we at the Emporium yet? Yeah, we're at the Emporium. Okay, because uh, so, uh, the baseball game we kind of talked about. Yeah. Um, Wiley Wiggins, who plays Mitch. Which also the greatest name ever. Yeah, um, he was actually just found coming out of a like a burger burger shack in Austin. Really, Don Phillips saw him across the street, ran across the street, like, "Hey, want to be in a movie?" Yeah, which I gotta imagine at that age because he, him, and um, the lead girl, uh, Kristen, who, okay. who plays uh, 
uh fuck i can't forget or i can't remember her name at the moment um uh, yeah i can't remember her name um but she's the lead freshman girl yeah the one that you know jody befriends and takes with her right right uh both of them were just kind of plucked out of obscurity yeah. and then had to go back to school after they finished yeah it's so weird. this was kind of their summer vacation yeah it was weird um he had also wiley had never thrown a baseball really and so but he's the pitcher yeah now obviously they can trick some stunt stuff uh but g- again god bless that documentary on the blu-ray because That's... it shows uh it shows richard linkletter trying to teach wiley wiggins how to throw a baseball that's so funny god bless that kid he could not throw it was horrific i could it, imagine it was the biggest like limp wristed type of throws he just couldn't figure out how to throw a yeah, ball yeah right and, and yeah so they're like all right well here's what we need we need at least a close up of you doing the wind up right yeah. and they went through all these outtakes of him he's like just just look mean for christ's sakes <laughs> yeah, <you know>? right. <laughs> we don't need you to throw the ball and i guess all the extras being the actual little league team we're talking so much shit about him of course it's like oh I'm so fucking angry that that's what the last take was <laughs> yeah right right <laughs> but that's where uh that's where mitch gets caught and paddled right by uh and the O'Banion, that, benny um uh, everybody everybody and the, that's the scene that they parody in family guy that's all i can see now that is that's all i see now every every time now ben affleck especially because it was that slow-mo shot of adam west in, in yeah. family guy doing the ben affleck part and it's like yep you have ruined it <laughs> You've, it's yes. it's it's basically like uh trying to watch amy schumer and not hearing south park in my head <laughs> yeah go ahead save a jan <laughs> <laughs> yeah right i know god damn it cartman <laughs> fucking damn it cartman south park's coming back this week actually today the no pro- it's wednesday wednesday the promo wednesday. promo looks fantastic well and then the the hashtag cancel cancel south, south park. park funny as hell but the 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 video they released today oh it's gonna be brutal we're gonna touch on some subjects <laughs> it's gonna be brutal and i can't wait um but pink obviously showing how much of a good guy he is yeah uh because mitch's friends all ditched him yeah because they don't want to get their asses yeah paddled. yeah they got the hell out of there and so pink basically it's grabs like, him and goes like come on man let's, let's give me a ride home let's do this and they have a little heart to heart and he's kind of you know smartening him up to to high school life and, yeah because mitch is obviously pissed at o'banion because he's like the resident badass fucking yeah. asshole bully yeah right and he's like well he's kind of a dick he's like yeah well, he's kind of a dick but he's a good guy to have blocking for you I mean, football yeah, and stuff right. like that um fun i always find it funny that o'banion like they set him up as the senior that flunked out just <laughs> right. to be an asshole again yeah right because in my high school we had like three guys that were seniors for like five years oh geez they were those guys that it's like dude you're like 20. yeah what like, are you doing you're gonna be forced out of this school yeah and it's weird that you're dating high school girls that is, even yeah. though you're in high school like that yeah. type of old guy yeah you know right. what i mean yeah right you shouldn't be here oh. Ooh, nice. not even a little bit so he drives mitch home tells him all right good get change put some ice on your ass and we'll pick you up and grab you some beers and blah 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 yeah blah. we're gonna do it and we are introduced to wooderson yes yep <laughs> Got a joint, man. Yeah, right. Like I could do McConaughey all fucking day. Like I love him so much It'd in this be movie. Much cooler if you did. Be a lot cooler if you did, man. <laughs> Just like fuck, dude. Seeing this movie through Mitch's eyes is is quite interesting, because he's experiencing all this for the first time. He's never hung out with Wooderson. Yeah, he's never right. gone yeah. to the Emporium. Like yeah. that was that was uh, like even Linkletter said it in his commentary. He's like the reason. It's in the their their entrance into the Emporium with right. Bob Dylan's Hurricane playing, is in slow motion and kind of slightly out of focus, coming in and out of focus, is because you're supposed to be seeing it through Mitch's point of view, right? And it's all just hazy and new and it's interesting and fun. And... He's waiting for the floor to drop out the whole fucking time, right? It's just that panic thing, um, and something that a lot of people have brought up, especially to Wiley Wiggins when they talk about this movie, is his incessant need to keep grabbing and pinching his nose okay yeah and is that scene where him and the actress's name is Kristen? oh sabrina sabrina was okay the, the other fre- the yes. female fresh his counterpart yeah, yeah 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 sabrina so there's that scene outside the emporium where they're having a chat about oh what are you doing here what are you doing here oh, this, <laughs> yeah. isn't this cool we're on the inside now but yeah. during that scene he keeps pinching his forehead and pinching yeah. his his nose excuse me and i guess much like with rocky horror now when they do like midnight screenings of this. Yeah, the crowd has a little bit of fun with that. Oh, that's there's like fun. a whole thing where they're they're yelling out one every time and counting off every time he does it in the movie. That's funny. Um, so yeah, so it's funny I didn't know that. They they uh, she tells him that 
they busted Hirschfelder, which is one of his friends, one of Mitch's friends, yeah. outside the uh, the rec center, which oh. they were having their end of year junior high dance. Right. You're and right. Uh, Hirschfelder was in the makeout room, which those were actually sanctioned things back then. Yeah. That was a little different from my time. Yeah. We, yeah. we didn't have an actual sanctioned black let room, you know, yeah. Where, yeah. where everybody's just. Actually, it was funny how he described it. Um, director Linkletter goes, he's like, yeah, because he went to high. Again, it was very autobiographical, going to high school in the seventies and stuff like that. Right. He's like, yeah, there was there was rooms at those parties that was just piles of bodies oh. <laughs> just like oh. piles of of scattered you know partially clothed bodies all yeah. over the place it's like Ooh. i didn't i couldn't really do that because they are children yeah right but i wanted to get that appearance you yeah. know um so yeah they, they busted hirschfelder uh carl another one of his his buddies there um so basically, that's where they plot the scheme to right. get back at Ben Affleck's character. Yeah, they want to get back at O'Banion. At, at, exactly. So they they develop devise this plan. Yeah. So she kind of goes and tells uh, Carl. Oh no, that's that's when he actually buys a six pack. That's yes. not with Sabrina. That's no. when Carl and, and and his friends see him after he buys a six pack of beer. Right. Another funny fucking scene um, where Mitch has to basically pretend to be of age. Yeah, which eighteen? I actually had to Google it when um, the legal drinking age changed. It was in the eighties. I couldn't believe it was that fucking late. Nineteen eighty four was when Congress passed the minimum drinking age to be lifted to twenty one, and they said basically everyone, every state had to conform to it by October of nineteen eighty six. Oh, okay. And I'm like, wow. Yeah. See, it was eighteen for that long. Like I was alive when the drinking age was eighteen. I wow. didn't really get that. That's crazy. So that that's why. The the uh the liquor store clerk says, "Are you eighteen?" as opposed to "Are you twenty one?" Right, because that's also why so many of these high school kids are so drink. readily available to beer. Right, because they're in. It wasn't like 18. they were looking for that Wooderson to go keep buying them all the beer. It's like, oh, no, I, I got, I'm eighteen. I I'm eighteen. I can go buy a six pack. Yeah, trunk full of beers. By the way, yeah, that was a wonderful shot when yes. when they're when they're actually uh, <laughs> paddling Hirschfelder and uh, and Benny pops the trunk. Yes. And it's just, it's an ice box, basically. It they, it's like that classic, like, we just put a tarp down and then filled it with ice. At, at hotel parties, you always see a bathtub full of beer. Right. But this was a trunk. Yes. This was a mobile yes. ice box. It was pretty, it was pretty <laughs> dope. But uh, Benny, played by Sasha Jensen, uh, not Benny, Don. Don was played by Sasha Jensen. I have a feeling that when the movie was coming out, they expected him to be a bigger star. Yeah. Because he was on all all the promotional material right he well, was on the poster in the trailer on all the dvd covers right looking back now you would think oh well they're gonna put you know affleck or mcconaughey at the forefront right but i think he was the one they were really looking at like he's gonna be the guy yeah it's because everyone's gonna love the stoner comedy he just didn't he, yeah he didn't really do much with it yeah like he's one he's one of the few that he's he's a classic that guy but I think for me, it's it's more because uh, he had a big role in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the movie. Yeah. Um, and then just kind of didn't go anywhere. Anywhere. But you got guys like you know Rory Cochran who played Slater, who mm -hmm. went on to you know he's a great actor now. Adam Goldberg, we've talked about Anthony Rapp, uh, is, again huge into theater acting. Um, and two Academy Award winners. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know there is that. A, little, a couple of little actors, little known actors, McConaughey and Affleck. Yeah. Um, but yeah. even like uh, Joey Lauren you know, Adams, one and, of them will play Batman. Yeah, yeah. You know, one of them will play Batman. The other one will just be Matthew McConaughey. <laughs> yeah, the other one's just Matthew McConaughey, <laughs> which is in itself just kind of fun. But again, it's it's much like we talked about last week with Fast Times that just finding those actors before right. they hit their stride, and even the people that they didn't cast. Like I said, Renee Zellweger, right. Ashley Judd, Vince Vaughn. These yeah. are people that they rejected. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, so so they so they're planning their plot. The, yeah, to get back at O'Banion. Um, fun part about this that I realized uh, when I watched this wasn't the first time I watched it at uh, with my surround system. Okay, I had done it once before, but once I watched it for the first time with you know full surround sound, I got the seven speakers, the subwoofer, all that. Right. The shit you hear in the back channels that you never heard if you just watched it like straight with one front speaker okay. is amazing. Of course, that's the beauty of surround sound. Every one of those scenes in the Emporium, you hear out of the fucking right back speaker, Ben Affleck shit-talking people while he's playing bull. That's so funny. Completely ad-libbed. Of course. And he's just sitting there, like, just completely dragging people through the dirt. That's really funny. That leads us to where 
yeah. the sophomore girl who's kind of sweet on Mitch. Yeah, walks by saying, "Oh, you're busting Carl Burnett out back," and that's and that's where they decide the to, one that they he, dump like paint on him or something. Right? Yeah, yeah. So he's like, the one whose mom pulled a shotgun. Right. Um. This was actually that's right. So he's gonna get the revenge on that, and then this yeah. was the scene that um the studio had a giant problem with. Okay. And, and really was trying to shut shut this whole fucking thing down at this point, because. As Linkler described in his commentary, they still had some weird notion that this could be a PG-13 movie. Oh, weird. If we just toned down the cursing. And then they got the dailies back, and Affleck's calling him a cocksucker and a motherfucker and fuck your yeah. mom. She's a cunt. I mean, he was going off the rails on, yeah, on all these outtakes. Of course. And they're like, we sent you a note yesterday to curb the swearing, <laughs> and then you send us this? Yeah, right. And he's like, yeah, but... We're doing drugs and and yeah. drinking and driving. There's no way this is not an R-rated movie, right? Of course. Um, so they they push through, but yeah, they yeah. dump paint on him. Yeah. Um, funny, funny, uh, uh, funny story about Affleck couldn't work a clutch on the car. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so it like every he even said it in the scene. He's like everything was great about Ben, but he couldn't fucking drive a clutch. Yeah, so funny. <laughs> he burned out two so, clutches in that car. So they ultimately end up having the keg party at the Moon Tower. The Moon Tower. Fiesta at the Moon Tower. Got <laughs> yeah. full kegs. Yeah. Everyone's gonna be there. Yeah. Just two geeks with right now. <laughs> yeah, right. Um and that just hit home personally for oh, yeah. me. Because that's what we used to do. We used to go into these woods over by BC. Yep. BC Law. And uh, that's what we used to do is we used to hang out in there mm -hmm. and just drink with these girls from this Catholic private school. Yeah, we, we had a we had a clearing in the woods. We had two of them in Linfield. Uh, one was behind the Christie's Market, right? And, and the other one was by the train tracks behind the the yeah behind the high school, right? And so basically, there's a lot of there's a lot of nonsense that ends up happening here. But everybody kind of it is what it is. It's a it's a kegger out in the woods, right? And but this is kind of where we get the the end. We get the end of the movie and the, kind of the thesis between what Pink and what Mitch are kind of experiencing. Yeah. Because they both kind of find out who they want to be in this moment, right? Or at this party, right? And Mitch kind of sees what high school is going to be like and kind of makes the decision that this is gonna. This is just kind of this awesome night in what hopefully will be the rest of his. Hey, he pulls a chick on his first night. Not too bad. Right. Not too bad. Goes to his and first high school party, party. Pulls a chick. Right. It's totally cool. And it's funny because it's so satisfying when he ultimately gets home. Right. And you know he has the interaction with his mother. The interaction that every kid that's shown up drunk at their house yeah. has. And it's like, oh man, that's relatable. And then you see, he he crushes the. I'm going to lay down and listen to music mm -hmm. while I go to bed yep. and just kind of reflect on what happened. Yep. And it's like, oh, yeah, that really takes me back as to, like, this was the first time that we I did something crazy like this. Mm -hmm. And the satisfied look on his face is awesome. Yep. And it's rewarding and it's great. And then it's, you know, on the flip side of Pink deciding not to sign the football thing and be like, look, man, I'm not going to, I'm not, I might play football. I might not play football. Well, they go to smoke their joints on the 50 yard line. Right. Right. <laughs> and he's just like, you know what? I'm going to go be me. I, the, the great line uh, that he says to the coach at the end after the police come and show up and yeah. kick him off the field, but they're not going to do anything because, you know, Texas high school football, plus it's the 70s. Yeah. Um, right. But he's the coach shows up and he's giving him the shit, you know, about, you know, those are the people I was telling you not to hang yeah. out with and losers right. like that don't care about our record or anything like that. And he's like, well, I'm going to go get Aerosmith tickets with my loser friends. Top priority of the summer. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's not in school anymore. Right. He doesn't have to give a shit about football until the fall. Right. You know what I you mean? Know, and and yes, as a kid at that age, going to get Aerosmith tickets would be a pro top priority. Top priority. By the way, the whole thing of having to drive to the stadium to get yeah. Aerosmith tickets as opposed to just you know opening your phone. Yeah. <laughs> Getting on Ticketmaster. So nostalgic for that shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I didn't actually have... waiting outside of a fucking arena for tickets. I didn't ever. I've never had to do that. Uh, but we used to do it because uh, Sam Goody yep. used to, you could buy tickets sure. there. Yep. And so we used to go to the Sam Goody and wait for the mall to open. The nice thing about that, I did it a lot uh, for WWE in the 90s. Yeah. And 
the nice thing about it was they'd always send a wrestler to the to do a signing at the first day they sell tickets. Oh, cool. So the first day tickets go on sale, there was usually somebody at the TD Garden, whatever it was back then, Boston Garden. <laughs> the regular garden. The regular garden. Um, no, it was actually TD Garden at that point. Uh, yeah, the Fleet Center. The Fleet Center. Um, they would send somebody there to do an autograph signing and a, a picture thing. They'd buy tickets. But those lines were fucking incorrigible. Yeah, of course they were. Standing for hours outside of a building just yeah. to... To buy a ticket and get a seat you probably didn't want because you showed up an hour after you probably should have. Yeah, right. You know? Or to right. get, a, get a picture with a hungover sable. Yeah, great. Yeah, Ooh, that sounds fun. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fun. But, yeah, that's Dazed and Confused. That is Dazed and Confused. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a movie that... If you haven't seen it, shame on you. Yes. Well, go see it. I mean, it's, it's easily a wonderful accessible. Movie. It's uh, easily accessible. It really is. Uh, I mean, I, I got the, like I said, I got the Criterion Blu-ray. Right. Um, it's available. The Again, Criterion Collection, while we will praise them and they're great, they're a bit on the pricier side for Blu-rays. Uh, yeah, you, I think it was like 30 bucks. But you can also get the Universal one for like 10 bucks. Well, that's the thing. If you're, If you just want to watch the movie... Get the regular. Get the get the regular release. If you're a yeah. if you're a film fan and you care about the extras, oh my god, the Criterion is the best. You, you will not beat it. Uh, I just w again, watching that documentary was like watching a whole other movie and getting a whole different perspective on it. Seeing the com listening to the commentary track, seeing all the, the the audition fucking tapes. I love that shit. I really do. Seeing all these guys when they first were starting out was phenomenal. But I'm sure you can also find it on some of the streaming platforms. Right. I don't know which one. Uh, I stars. Did, what, the stars. Stars have it? Okay. So there you go. If you have Stars, uh, you can check it out there. Yeah. So, um, and that includes that includes Hulu. So if you have the Stars oh, add-on okay. to Hulu, oh, very cool. you can stream it through Hulu. I did not know that. All yeah. right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. That is Dazed and Confused from 1993. Happy 25th anniversary to yeah. Dazed and Confused. Next week... Oh, I've been I've been itching. I've been itching Ooh, to get baby. my horror fix on and October is upon us. Yes. And we are jumping Shocktober, in October, baby. We have a full lineup of the greatest modern day classic horror monsters. Starting yeah. it off with Jason Voorhees. I love him. And the original Friday the thirteenth. Yes. Coming up next week. You you are gonna want to enjoy this because what I'm gonna do, um, because every October I do a, there's a little, there's an online uh, message board site called DVD Talk. Okay. That I, it was like my th first message board I ever signed up Ooh, for. fun. But every October is the only time I go to it now okay. because they do 100 horror movies in 31 days and everybody kind of, you know, keeps their list of movies and they have giveaways and stuff. Oh, fun. Like I've won Blu-rays from them before. They sent me Basket Case and Prom Night on Blu-ray. Ooh, Because just random drawings, I guess. But since we're doing this each week, I'm going to not only watch the movie we're covering, but all the movies in that series. Oh, very fun. It's going to be an endeavor because that most of them be an span 9 to 11 movies. Uh, but yeah, so next week when we cover Friday the 13th, it will be Friday the 13th and then some on that movie show. Thank you for joining us. Mike Went, Liam Stryker, Bill Neville. You can follow us all on the Twitter and every other social media. You can find our audio and video archives at newageinsiders.com and be sure to hit the subscribe button on your favorite podcast to New Age Insiders Pop. See you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.